الله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين my dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh There's a very beautiful hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said majtama'a qawmun fi baytin min buyutillah that there is no people who gather in one of the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yatluna kitabullah wa yatadarasunahu baynahum and that they study and mention the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illa except Nazalat alayhi musakina, except the tranquility will descend upon them. Wagashiyat humur rahma, and that the mercy will encompass them. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wahafat humul malaika, and that the angels will cover them with their wings. Wadhakaramullahu ta'ala fi man indah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will mention those people whom here. So we ask Allah Jalla wa'ala to make us from those people who receive these four blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ameen. So the series that's been continuing for the past few weeks, why? is quite an interesting one from a different or a number of different perspectives. Because essentially when you see the title of each talk, it's almost deficient. It poses another question. It's a question that poses another question. So, why Islam? Why Islam what? Why are you who, and who is your audience and who are you talking to? So really the question is, depending on whom you're addressing and the listener, that they may understand it differently. So why Islam is the truth? Or why Islam should be followed? Or maybe from a non-Muslim perspective, why should I, why should I follow Islam? Similarly, our today's talk. Why Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam? Why Muhammad what? Why is he, sallallahu alayhi salam, a prophet? Or why should I, why should I read about, or why should I follow Muhammad, alayhi salatu salam? So really the content of this particular gathering here today, and how it is understood, really goes back to the listener. The one who is listening to this talk and how they will interpret or how they will want to benefit from the talk. From a Muslim perspective, no doubt, inshallah ta'ala, the goal is for us to increase iman, to know about our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for us to recognize why Muhammad alayhi salatu wa was the greatest man that ever lived on earth. From a non-Muslim perspective, they happen to listen to a, a talk like this, why Muhammad alayhi salatu wa then... I've heard a lot about Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. Why should I read about him? Why should I even become one of his followers? Similarly, the same principle can be used for the other talks or from the, from the other weeks. From our, from our perspective, why Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, we can add to why indeed he was the messenger of Allah. Why he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver the final revelation to mankind. There are many things that we can add. But going through this was really uh, a journey through the seerah, through the life of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasallam, picking up on important topics, uh, events, which really many of the incidents deserve their own lecture, deserve their own time. Now, as Muslims, we do not need to give credence to give status to our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Allah jalla wa ala already gave him that, that he is Muhammadun Rasulullah, that he is Muhammad, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what he, alayhi salatu salam, contributed to humanity is beyond the scope of this lecture or this time that we have together. 30, 35 minutes, 40 minutes. To really go into detail what our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left behind, changed the course. Yes, changed the course of humanity. 
to go into great detail and to think about it really is beyond the scope of this sitting that we have here together. Nonetheless, a simple examination and going through the life of the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, you will very soon find that this is no doubt not an ordinary individual. If you start from the very beginning of his birth up until he became was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a messenger or prophet and then the 23 years or so that he was a prophet and messenger he was a most outstanding individual. That's easy for me and easy for a Muslim to say such statements but like anything a person's life can only be looked at by what they put forth. Similarly, our lives, when we live for whatever duration that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to us, that is the footprint or that is the fingerprint that we left on this earth. Once we are gone, that is what we leave behind. Now, it can be looked at if you want to praise an individual or say something good about a person, it would go even further, it would go even further that if his enemies at the time spoke good about him, those who believed in him, those who followed him and spoke well of him, one could argue, one could argue to say that, well, of course they're going to say that because they believed in him and they are from his followers. But what about those people who disbelieved in him, those people who rejected him, those people who fought against him on the battlefield, drew swords, willing to shed blood, to rid themselves of this individual. If those people were to speak well of him, or if non-Muslims were to speak well of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, surely one has to take heed of that. That surely that has some weight. That has some value. And especially in the modern day now, in times now where the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is spoken about by so many different people. From different backgrounds, some speaking well against the, uh, regarding the Prophet, some speaking very badly about the Prophet. A lot of them have their own agendas, a lot of them have their own biases because it supports where they want to come from. Maybe they want to quote a few incidents from the seerah of the Prophet and said, Did your messenger, did he do this or did he do that? Doesn't want to give any context to that. Now for us as Muslims talking about our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi there's nothing for us to hide. Nothing at all that we have any feeling in our hearts or minds that, you know, don't really tell people about that. He is the most documented individual, the most written, uh, written about person probably in human history. We have books of Ahadith, Bukhari, Muslim, the books of Sunan, the Musnad, all of these books writing about and narrating the statements of every word that he said. An autobiography maybe of personalities in the 20th century, maybe you could write 450 pages about their lifespan. But here we have thousands and thousands and thousands of narrations talking about how he spoke, how he walked, how he ate, how he dealt with individuals, to the finest detail, nothing is hidden. So talking about the Prophet ﷺ is not something we can even attempt to hide. Nor would we want to anyway as believers. So, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, if I mention an incident, because I mentioned if an, an enemy, somebody who is against you, speaks well of you, surely that has some, some standing. I want to mention a couple of those inshallah ta'ala. Abu Sufyan, who later on embraced Islam, he was a very well-known individual, a nobleman in Mecca. He was a polytheist at the time, and he was a well-known businessman, and he was in a sham. Now, at that time, and this incident is mentioned in Al-Bukhari, right at the beginning of, or the first couple of hadith of Al-Bukhari, that Hiraqal, who was the emperor of the Roman Empire, 
He was there and he had heard about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, is there anybody from amongst yourselves who knows this individual? Any from his relatives? No one said anything except then Abu Sufyan, who was from Mecca, from the Quraysh, from his tribe. He said, I am from his people. Hiraqal had a number of questions. And he said, Hiraqal is asking questions to Abu Sufyan. The first question I have is, what is his status amongst yourselves? What is his family status? And he replied that he is from a noble family, a well, good, upright, good standing family within our society. Has anybody amongst his ancestors claimed to be a prophet? And he, re he replied, no. He said, was any of his ancestors a king or a leader in this manner? He said, no. Do the nobles, the rich, or the poor, they follow him. And he replied, majority of the poor people follow him. And they are increasing. Does anybody amongst those embrace his religion, then become displeased and then renounce the religion? He replied, no. If you look carefully at these answers, they're very precise questions. Why did he ask, is there any prophet from his ancestors or any kings? Meaning that he doesn't want to reclaim status, some high position within his society. That I'm the rightful king of the land. My ancestors once upon a time ruled the land. It's not something he's claiming. Nor is he offering riches of the world. Why? Because it's the majority of the poor people who are following him. And the poor people are increasing. Does anybody return to disbelief after? No. Why? Because they are pleased with the message that they are accepting. Have you, ever acclaimed, have you ever acclaimed that he was a liar before? There's another question. Before he became a prophet, was he known as a liar? And he said no. Does he break his promises? No. Even Abu Sufyan, he wanted to say something negative towards the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, but he had no choice but to say the truth in that he may be called a liar. That what he's saying is false. Even though he had full opportunity to say something negative against the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, but he could not. In fact, his own society knew him as as sadiq al amin the truthful one, the trustworthy one. Even when, subhanallah, when the Prophet ﷺ was known as a prophet and messenger, belongings were left with him as a trust to look after. Non-Muslims would leave their belongings in his trust that he would look after them. And that before the Prophet ﷺ made the hijrah from Makkah to Medina, that he commanded Ali ibn Abi Talib to return the belongings to the rightful owners. This is the status that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had within his own community. The conversation continues, and it is a long hadith, and maybe you can refer back to it, inshallah ta'ala. Now, if we move on throughout the ages, Muslims were, at least from the Western Crusades, were demonized. Known as savages, barbarians, and Muhammadans. They were known many terms to try and wrong them and put them in a negative light so that those people who believed that they were on some form of crusade, they could justify it by returning Al-Quds to them. This is not something new. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the people of the Quraysh, the polytheists of the Quraysh tried to make up, but what can we call Muhammad ﷺ? Shall we call him a sha'ir? Shall we call him a poet? Shall we call him majnoon, that he is insane? Shall we call him a sahir, that he is a magician? A soothsayer, a fortune teller? None of these negative terms were even close to what the Prophet ﷺ was known as. So no term would fit. Eventually they came up with this, he's like a sahir, he's like a magician. Why? Because he separates the relationship between the father and the son. The father who maybe embraced Islam or vice versa, that there was a splitting of the family. So they would say he's like a magician, that he's doing some form of magic splitting up the families. Even though that was not the truth and they knew it. 
So the demonization of the Prophet Muhammad is not something new. But even when the people who were bitter enemies of the Prophet in all honest terms, they could only say something good about him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Throughout the Crusades, when they say, would say something bad against Islam or the Prophet Muhammad sallam, they knew, they knew it was false. They knew it was lies. Up until this day now, things haven't changed. That maybe there are individuals who want to try and tarnish the Qur'an. They want to tarnish Islam. They want to tarnish the personality of the Prophet ﷺ. And maybe they say one or two verses from the Qur'an. They don't know the verse that came before. They don't know the verse that comes after. Really exposing themselves as ignorant people, biased people. Almost because of the, what they are saying, they're seen as vile people. That they cause embarrassment to themselves because of the ignorance that they are showing. Not wanting to know the truth, but they have their own agendas. So as Muslims, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved the personality, the individual, our Nabi salam. No matter what people say, no matter what people may throw out, it's all of no value. Let's go back maybe 200 years, 250 years. An individual called Cardifo, who is a French philosopher. He's not a Muslim. The names that I mentioned to you now, these aren't Muslims. They have no vested interest. They're not paid by the Khilafah. They're not paid behind the, or under the table with something. These people are in their own right, maybe Christians, Protestants, Catholics, philosophers, but they're non-Muslims. So Qadi for the French philosopher, what does he say? He says that the Prophet Muhammad was the most inspiring prophet and believer. No one can contest this high status. The feelings of equality and fraternity founded by Muhammad among the Islamic bloc were applied in practice even on the Prophet Muhammad himself. This is a French philosopher talking about our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa Tolstoy is another. He's a Russian writer and philosopher. And he admired Islam. And he admired its teachings. What did he say? Because he wrote an article, Who is Muhammad? He said, Muhammad is both a founder and a messenger. And he was among the great men who served, or great men who served the social frame, framework profoundly. Thomas Carlyle, a famous English philosopher who passed away in 1881. He devoted an entire chapter in his book. He wrote a book called Heroes and Hero Worship. And he has a chapter on our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, writing against those prejudiced, a prejudiced atheists who would speak negatively about our beloved Nabi alayhi wa sallam, he said, prejudiced atheists claim that Muhammad only desired personal fame, glory, and authority. The complete opposite. Each of those terms, the complete opposite. By God, this is false. This is a false claim. This great, deep-hearted son of the desert, with his beaming black eyes, deep soul, full of mercy and beneficence, kindness and piety, wisdom and persuasion, had thoughts in him and other than worldly ambitions. Again, this is a great philosopher who is respected in the Western narrative. There are more like Edward Ramsey and Lamartine and George Bernard Shaw, a great English philosopher, a great English writer. And at the end he said, it is possible to confirm my prediction by saying that the religion of Islam will inevitably be accepted in Europe in the near future. And I believe that if such a man like Muhammad والسلام, was given authority over the modern world, he would succeed in solving its problems in a way that would bring much needed peace and happiness. This is again a non-Muslim who's saying such statements. A person who within society and within philosophy and within writers has weight, is not a nobody. Even Michael H. Hutt, who's an American writer, 
American, very influential person within this area. He wrote a book in 1978, you may know this book. It's called 100 Most Influential Persons in History. And in 1978, this individual, Michael Hart, he put the, mo the number one most influential person in history was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And there's a number of conditions that one would ha have to fulfill to be in the book in the first place. And he said that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was supremely successful in both in the religious and the secular term. He also believed that Muhammad sallam's role in the development of Islam was far more influential than Jesus in the Christian narrative. Because it is seen as St. Paul, in their eyes, who is the real reformer and the real one, the individual who formed the modern day understanding of Christianity. So the Prophet Muhammad was supremely successful. These are individuals, and the list goes on. These are individuals who have no common vested interest to support our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But yet these words are only in the positive way looking at a positive way looking at the Prophet Muhammad So what would cause them to say such things? Why would they say such statements? You have to realize that maybe the majority of people don't go to this depth, don't go to this depth of understanding or reading about the Prophet. They won't do that. The majority of people in the street, when they see Islam, they see you. What is Islam? They will see you. This is what Islam is. Because you call yourself a Muslim. You're a follower of the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, So their view of Islam is how they view you, how you'll behave. But then in turn, we have to look at ourselves. How close are we to the message? And how close are we to what the Prophet wasalam, taught us? So the Prophet as a human being, as a person, as a husband, as a father, a leader, a statesman, a soldier, a businessman, a judge, a neighbor, a prophet, and a messenger. He had all of these titles. We can praise him, but there is no greater praise than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah Jalla wa Ala spoke our beloved Nabi, spoke about our beloved Nabi salam, in the Quran. When he said, لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That you have in the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an excellent pattern, a beautiful and perfect example to follow. A character, a manner, above all. That you are upon a great manner. Innaka la ala That you are upon a great manager, a great manner. Aisha radiallahu anhu was asked about the actions and the behavior of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she could only answer, Kana khuluquhu al Quran. His manner was the Quran. Everything that you find in the Qur'an, remembering that the Qur'an is the perfect word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was the perfect human being. Whatever manner you find in the Qur'an, that is what you would find in the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He excelled in each of these positions that I mentioned to you. As a father, as a husband, as a leader, as a judge, as a neighbor, as a messenger, as a prophet. He excelled. Absolutely in every single aspect of these responsibilities. When he was growing up, before he became a messenger, was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, living in a society full of vice, full of haram. Haram was easy. It was easy to fall into haram at that time. Some similarities to what you maybe find now. To find the haram is very easy. To find the halal takes some effort from you. To stay on the straight path will require some effort from you. But to fall into the haram is very easy. You can just go across the road in the supermarket and buy whatever you like. Whether it's alcohol or haram food. It's all there. No one will question you. No one will say anything to you. It's there. As long as you have the money to pay for it, it's yours. To go to your home and do as you like. 
Similarly, at the time of Rasulullah sallam, to worship idols, to slaughter for idols, to steal, poach, the rich would oppress the weak, the strong oppressing the weak. This was the norm. However, Allah Jalla wa ala protected, preserved our Nabi والسلام, from all of these things. And what supports this is that before he sallallahu alayhi wa received the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he do? He would, he would feel at despair from his people. And he would leave Mecca itself and go to a cave, isolate himself from what was happening. To be in the presence of all of this was, was too much. So he alayhi wa would go to the cave of Al-Hira. And at times, not just to go there for a couple of hours, but as narrated that Khadija radiallahu anha, his wife, she would prepare some food as much as he could take away for three, four, five days to stay away from what was going on in Mecca, the purest place on earth, except the most evil crimes were going on. And this was unacceptable to the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to see this. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed revelation to our Nabi alayhi salatu salam. The Prophet alayhi salatu salam born as an orphan. Only then at the age of six for his mother to pass away. His mother at the time is what, around maybe 20, 21 years old. She was very young. Then he goes into the custody of his or guardianship of his grandfather. And then he passes away when the, the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, is at eight years old. Imagine now for any child never to meet their father, to have some settlement just for a few years and then your mother passes away, then to go to the guardianship of your grandfather, then he passes away. For any child that's nearly overwhelming for them. Then goes into the guardianship of his uncle, Abu Talib, who's not particularly well off. So the Prophet Muhammad, والسلام, of course, bearing in mind, he hasn't received any revelation. He's not a prophet or messenger at this time, والسلام, but no doubt is protected and preserved by Allah. Jalla wa he grows up and he takes on a number of jobs being a shepherd, learning trades, remaining in Mecca, seeing what is going on. He marries at the age of 25. And he marries Khadija radiallahu anha. Now the support that Khadija radiallahu anha gives the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, is really something to be pondered over deeply. Because we can see from the seerah, the life of Rasulullah that he would think about her quite a lot, even after she passed away. And he would remind people that she believed in me when everybody rejected me. She supported me when no one would. So Khadija radiallahu anha has a very big place in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She passes away when he's 50, approximately alayhi salatu salam. So he's lost, subhanAllah, some beloved people when he was younger. He lost his wife. Our Nabi والسلام, had seven children. Seven. Six of them died during his lifetime. To lose one child is something beyond comprehension. But to lose six. Only Fatima radiallahu anha lived after our beloved Nabi والسلام, to, have, to bury your own children. Even them being very, very young. For example, Ibrahim is approximately 18 or 20 months old. The Prophet ﷺ is about 60 years old. Then he is called suddenly to go to the edge of Medina to see his son who's gravely ill. Only there to hold his son who's breathing very, very faintly and then eventually passes away in his hands. When he first received revelation, alayhi salatu salam, his people rejected him. They tried to drive him out. 
They punished and oppressed and persecuted his companions. They killed the polytheists of Mecca. They killed some of his companions, some of his close friends. Ammar ibn Yasir, radiallahu anhu, when he saw his own mother martyred, what did the Prophet say to Ammar ibn Yasir? Be patient, O Ammar, for inna mawidakum al jannah. That your appointed time will be the paradise, if you are patient. So the Prophet ﷺ faced trial after trial after trial. What I say to you now is not something that was written in a storybook by a person. This is documented history. This is documented history about which there is no doubt about it. Absolutely no doubt. So those people who spoke well of the Prophet ﷺ, they must have done some reading. They must have looked at the personality of the Prophet ﷺ for them to come to this conclusion. Because one who looks at his life and studies his life can only possibly come to the conclusion that this was the most outstanding individual that I have never met. This is the most outstanding individual I have ever heard about. Even the people, I can never meet a person like this. So if he is the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, question, maybe he faced so many trials. Why would an individual who's so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala face so many trials? The loss of wives and children and loved ones and friends and companions and his people to reject him. This is a beloved person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَشَدُّ النَّاسِ بِتِلَاءً As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would inform us. The most severely tested people are the Anbiya. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala إِذَا حَبَّ اللَّهُ عَبْدًا إِبْتَلَى If Allah loves a servant, He will test him. So no doubt, these tests that came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in the face of that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam never once said anything why or how or what, but faced every single trial with the utmost level of patience, of a sabr. And seek aid and help in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with patience and with prayer. And that our beloved Nabi alayhi salatu salam on all and each of every one of these occasions would demonstrate exemplary patience. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards patience bi ghayri hisab. There is a reward for patience which has no limit. So our Nabi alayhi salam is of such a high status for many reasons. From them is that he was tested more than any other individual and in the face of that was the most patient individual in the history of mankind. He was alayhi salatu salam akram al nas. He was the most generous of people. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma narrates كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أكرم الناس. Not that the Prophet عليه السلام was the richest of people because he was not in terms of mal, but yet he was seen as the most generous of people. So generosity or being seen as generous is not how much you give. It's not about how much wealth you have for you to give, but rather it is seen in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Whatever you have, that you give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala. كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أجود الناس in another narration the most generous of people that he صلى الله عليه وسلم أعدل الناس that he was the most just and fair of people even the non-Muslims at the time that they would come to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم for judgment even though they had their own chiefs and judges they could be bribed. They could be asked to look at the, the, the situation from one side and to ignore the other. But they would go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they knew he would say how it is. Al-Haq, the truth would be said regardless of who is saying it.
A very famous statement that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Innama ahlaka man kana qablakum. That what destroyed previous nations, إِذَا صَدَقَ فِيهِمُ الشَّرِيفِ That if a well-known noble person would steal, taraku, that they would leave him. He's a noble. You can't establish the punishment on that individual. وَإِذَا صَدَقَ فِيهِمُ الضَّعِيفِ أَقَامُ عَلَيْهِ الْحَدِّ but the weak person, the person who doesn't ever have a very high status within the community, let's establish the punishment on this individual. Let's teach this individual and in turn teach the community how we show people that we don't stand for this. Nations were destroyed for this. Because justice, fairness, is not known by where you come from, what the color of your skin, the language that you speak. This is all irrelevant. Justice and fairness, equity should be for every single person regardless of who you are. The Prophet Muhammad said, even if my own daughter was to steal, I would be the one to establish the punishment for her. To make it very clear to people how important it is to be just and fair regardless of who you are. Even if that person is your own family member. Our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Arhamun Nas. Why Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why? Because he was the most merciful of people. He showed and demonstrated mercy on all occasions. Even in his ibadah. Even in his worship. How? There were times when the Prophet alayhi wa would be leading the salah. And he would hear a small child crying in the masjid. That he would not lengthen the prayer, but he would shorten the prayer. Not meaning that lower the number of rakat, but shorten the amount of qira'ah that would be said in the prayer. So that the mother would not be worried about her child. Showing lutf, compassion and mercy to those people who were there praying with him. In the prayer that the Prophet would carry his own granddaughter in the prayer. That while in sujood, that he sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, while in sujood, that his grandchildren, that Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhuma, they would climb on his back. And on an occasion, they were so long on his back, alayhi wa he stayed there in sujood. Until some of the companions, they raised their head to see what had happened. And then after the salah, the Prophet alayhi wa sallam informed the companions that he didn't want to get up from sujood, except that those two grandchildren had had their enough. They had enough time on his back and then they got off and then he continued with his ibadah. That he would be seeing and caring and attending the affairs of the ummah on a daily basis. Tribes would be coming and traveling hundreds of miles to speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to debate with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on a daily basis. A very busy individual. Yet when he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would go home, as Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, كَانَ ala khidmati ahlihi. He would be at the service of his family. He would sew his own shoe. Wouldn't be dependent on other people. This is the individual that is known as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu served he served the Prophet ﷺ for, for 10 years. He said that the Prophet ﷺ did not say to me once, Uff, to show any form of displeasure to me. And Anas radiallahu anhu is a young boy. Maybe he's late attending an errand or doing something. The Prophet ﷺ asked him to do something. The Prophet ﷺ never showed any displeasure in what Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu did for him. In the year that both Khadija radiallahu anha and Abu Talib, they died. They died in the same year. Approximately two or three months between them in the 10th year after the Prophet had first received revelation. This is one of the saddest times, one of the most down times for our beloved Nabi alayhi He'd lost his inner support, his family support from his wife and the outward support that was there from Abu Talib protecting 
the Prophet ﷺ from the attack of the other tribes. When they both died, this was of great sadness to the Prophet ﷺ to lose two beloved people to him. So then he went to a Ta'if. He called his people for seven years openly and they had rejected him. So to go to Ta'if, which is not too far away from Mecca, maybe 90 kilometers, 100 kilometers away. So the Prophet ﷺ goes to Ta'if to call these people to Islam. Maybe they, maybe a few of them will accept Islam, maybe. Banu Thaqif was a well-known tribe there. They didn't even let the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ finish delivering the message. They commanded the children, the foolish people of the city, to run the Prophet ﷺ out of the city, throw stones at him, to belittle him, to throw shoes at the Prophet ﷺ, until blood was drawn from the body of Rasulullah ﷺ, blood into his sandals, as is described in the seerah. That moment, the loss of family, his own people rejecting him, going to another city, rejecting him. How much perseverance and sabr can a person have? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, or sends al amin al sama the trustworthy one of the sky, Jibreel alayhi salam, to Amin al-Ard, to the trustworthy one on earth. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and gives him a choice. Now we're told, don't make a decision when emotions are running high. Don't make a decision when, when emotions are running high. Maybe you'll say something wrong and then you later regret it. Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I have been commanded by Allah jalla wa ala to tell the malaika or the angels of the Jibal of these two al-akhshabain, these two mountains, to be, ra to be raised and to crush, to dismantle this city, don't exist anymore, for what they did to you. Now, in a situation like this, what they did to him, to try and humiliate him, to run him out in this manner, it seems only fair, only fair to say that they wronged me in a way which was completely unacceptable. But here we are dealing with an individual that was like no other. Didn't think like you and I. He said, no. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise people from them who will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe these people won't. But maybe their generations after, maybe they will. And lo and behold, the mercy that was shown by our Nabi salam, the forethought, thinking about the future, they embraced Islam just a few years later. There are many things that we can say about our beloved Nabi salam, and really... One has to read the seerah and read it again and read it again to really try and increase a love and a value for the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in our lives. And anyone, Muslim or non-Muslim alike, I challenge you, non-Muslim more, to read about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And if you find something you don't like, I can tell you, you've misunderstood it. One million percent. This is an individual, if you look at his life, was the most exemplary person that ever existed on earth from every single aspect that you can imagine. One of the ulama, they wrote about the Prophet والسلام, and they said, a number of the good qualities of his character which have been compiled can be said in the following. He was the most forbearing of people, the most courageous of people, the most just of people, the most chaste of people. His hand never touched the hand of any woman unless he was married to her or closely related to her.
by blood. He was the most generous of people who never kept a dinar or dirham with him overnight. If he had anything left over and he could not find someone to give it to before the night came, he would not go home until he donated to it somebody who needed it more than him. He did not take anything from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had bestowed upon him except he would have only enough that was in front of him. He would not hoard. He would not gather. There were times when a poor woman, she comes to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with two young children. And she knocks on the door of Aisha radiallahu anha. The messenger alayhi is not there. And she is poor, she has nothing. So Aisha radiallahu anha, what does she do? She's shuffling around to find something. All she finds is three dates. Three dates in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and she gives those three dates away. This was the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa If you were to enter the house, you would see where he slept. And he slept on palm fibers, palm leaves. Whereas the leaders of the Byzantine Empire and Persia, they slept on gold and silk. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he enters the home of the Messenger alayhi salatu salam. The Messenger alayhi salam wakes and turns to look at Umar, only for Umar to see the marks of the palm fibers on the back of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And Umar seeing the most beloved person to him, who is deserving the best of this world and the best of the hereafter. And he cries and says, Ya Rasulullah, the kings and the leaders of the other nations are sleeping on this and you are sleeping on that. He says, no Umar. For them they will have what they have in this dunya. And for us, we will have what we have in the akhirah. Our place, our existence, we're here for just a short while, a little while. Just like the example of a person on a journey who takes a rest by a tree and then he continues on his journey. That small rest that he takes by a tree, this is your time in the dunya. This is all you have. Like the blinking of an eye. You're here for a few years and then you're gone the next. If I were to ask you, your great-grandfather or your great-great-grandfather, do you know his name? Or your great-great-grandmother, do you know her name? Maybe you don't. Maybe a time will come when you have children and maybe you will be given the title of a great-grandfather. Maybe you don't see your great-grandchildren. Will they know your name? Will they know who you were? Maybe you'll be forgotten. You will die, you will be buried, and you are gone. But there are names that exist throughout history that maybe you think that they didn't do very much. If you think about Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu is Sayyid al-Aws. He was the chieftain of the tribe of Aws. He was around 30 years old, embraced Islam, and was a Muslim for maybe four years, five years. Not long. At the Battle of Khandaq, he was injured. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he was injured. And then after about three or four days, he had an injury in his neck. He passed away, shaheed. And then when he died, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam behaved differently with his burial. That the Prophet وسلم, upon carrying his brother, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, raised his izar, raised his bottom garment, and was almost tiptoeing in carrying the body of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh عنه, to the grave. And the companions, they realized, they saw this. How the Messenger والسلام, is walking. And then Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, عنه, he is buried. The Prophet ﷺ said that the throne of Rahman shook at the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. The only companion for that to happen. That Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, in which the Prophet ﷺ said that every person will have a squeezing of the grave. And if anyone was to be saved from the squeezing of the grave, it would be Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. But he received it only once. 
So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, is he from the ten blessed of Jannah? No, he is not. Was Islam was a Muslim for four or five years? There was something special. There were certain things that asrar, secrets that he had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when the Prophet is carrying this individual and then telling the companions, 70,000 malaika, 70,000 angels attending the janazah to bury Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. So it's not necessarily about how mushhur you are, how famous you are, how well known you are, how many people, they don't know his name, they don't know her name. And maybe only a couple of people attend their janazah. Maybe nobody attends their burial. But that individual in the Allah, but that person with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is at a level only Allah knows about it. It's not about shuhra, fame, collection and hoarding. It's about you and your Lord. The alimi continues in describing our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was never asked of anything except that he gave it. Then he would go back to his supplies and then donate from them who needed it more. He used to repair his own sandals and mend his own clothes and he would help his family in the home and cut meat for them. So as he was busy, alayhi salatu salam, tending to the affairs of the ummah, he would spend three, four, five hours at night in salah on his own. And that Aisha radiallahu anha says, Ya Rasulullah, your feet are swelling. You will pray, of course, no doubt, Salat al-Fajr in the masjid, and people will come to you, be asking you questions. When is the rest? But yet at night, he's still offering ibadah, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Afala akunu abdan shakura. Should I not be a thankful and grateful slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He was the most modest of people and would not look at anybody straight in the eye. He would respond to the invitations of a slave and a free alike and accept a gift, even if it was a cup of milk. And he would reward, reward the person for that. He did not eat the food that had been given in charity and he would not respond. And he would respond to the slaves and the poor when they asked for something. He became angry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but not angry for his own sake. And he would adhere to the truth, even if that would lead to maybe some harm that may come to his own companions. But the haq in the treaty of Hudaybiyyah, when the Prophet ﷺ agreed with the Quraysh in the seventh year after Hijrah, that the Muslims, if anyone escaped Mecca, that they have to be returned to the Quraysh. But that was the agreement. Any Muslim that escapes Mecca, that he would have to give him, send him back to the Quraysh, the disbeliever, and they would, of course, punish him. Upon agreement, upon that, subhanAllah, Jundub radiallahu anhu, he came in chains. He escaped Makkah, because he had heard the Muslims had gathered just outside of Makkah, looking in a terrible state. The Muslims, they wanted to see their brother, to welcome their brother, to save their brother, but he was reminded that you have just signed. You have just signed the agreement. He has to be sent back. And he was sent back. Some of the companions couldn't believe what had happened. From them, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Are we not above them, Rasulullah? Are we not Muslims? We have Islam. They have disbelief and they reject you. Here the Prophet وسلم, said to him in no uncertain terms, this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not something we have a choice in. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would tie a rock to his stomach to ward off the pangs of hunger. He never ate to his fill. He walked among his enemies without a god. He was the most humble and quiet of people without being arrogant, the most eloquent without being long-winded, and the most cheerful of countenance. He didn't worry about worldly matters. He wore whatever he found. He let his slave or servants and others ride on the ride that he had and he would walk next to them. He rode whatever was available. 
sometimes a horse, sometimes a camel, sometimes a donkey, sometimes a mule. Sometimes he would walk barefoot, sometimes with no cloak, sometimes with a turban, sometimes without a turban. He would visit the sick in the furthest parts of al Medina, that he loved perfume and he hated foul smells. He would sit with the poor and he would offer food and eat with them. And he would serve the needy, honoring the virtuous and softening the hearts of people by treating them kindly. He upheld the, the, kins of, the kinship without favoring relatives over others. Maybe those who were maybe better than others, he treated them the same. He never treated anybody harshly. He accepted the excuses of those who apologized. He would joke, but he would only tell the truth. And he would smile without laughing out loud. If he saw permissible play, he did not denounce it. And he raced with his wife, والسلام, When voices were raised against him, he bore that with patience. He did not waste time without striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or doing that what was essential to better himself. He never looked down upon any poor person because of their poverty or their chronic sickness. And he did not fear any king because of the power that they had. And he called all of them and every single person to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on equal terms. When we know about all of these things and what he did for his people, and that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would make dua, and he would make dua for his companions who would, who would come after him, that he never met. He would do that in each and every single of his salah to make dua for you and I. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The meaning of the verse is so much more profound. That we did not send you, O Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, except as a mercy to mankind. From every respect, he was a mercy to people. Even now, even now he is a mercy to mankind. Because his message, وَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ remains with us. And that message is a mercy to people to remove injustice, to remove oppression, to remove crime and vice and filth and harm, to bring people back to a clean way of living. This message remains with us. And all blessings and thanks, it goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the eighth year after Mecca, in the eighth year, eighth year after Hijrah, he returned to Mecca. Eight years after he'd been forced out of his own his own land. The people there who had killed some of his companions, persecuted him, persecuted his family. The Prophet ﷺ entered into Mecca, 10,000 of Muslims. The polytheists of Mecca laid their arms on the floor. Now's the time to get revenge. What these people had done to you and your family and your loved ones, but cursed and oppressed and killed, now is the day to take every single one of those people to account. Even some of the companions, they said, this is the day of revenge, Ya Rasulullah. This is the day we will get our day back. And when mercy is really shown is when you have the ability to do as you like. You have full power, full authority to do as you like to that individual. But you did not come you were not sent to rid the people, to chase the people away. You were not sent, Ya Rasulullah Alaihi as a person to chase people away, to punish people. But he was sent, Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, as a mercy to mankind. He said, This is a day of mercy. Even when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered into Mecca with his head down in humbleness gratefulness and thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that now Mecca could finally be restored to its original foundations. No polytheism, no idol worship, no sacrificing for other than Allah. Only ibadah lillah. Only worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawaf, done correctly. And when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu 
And Salahuddin al Ayyubi radiallahu rahimahullah throughout history, and this is a test to the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu being implemented throughout the ages. When these two individuals, Umar radiallahu anhu and Salahuddin al Ayyubi, when they entered into Al Quds, after previously the Muslim blood was spilt, that being shed and th flowing through the, the streets of Al Aqsa till it reached the knees, they went there and they said clemency and mercy to people here. No shedding of blood today. This is what they inherited from our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And finally, I end with what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us. إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was only sent to teach and perfect the manners. Your manners with your Lord, the manners with yourself, and your manners with every single person you come in contact with. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forgives of all of our shortcomings. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become glowing examples of what it is to be a Muslim. And that Islam becomes the central part of our lives. And that we die in a state that Allah Jalla wa'ala is pleased with us. Allahumma ameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'im. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.